Ladies and gentlemen, may I request you to please settle down. We are ready with our panelists here and about to begin with the session on Indian economy. Is a recovery in sight? Chairing this session is Dr. Janma Jayasena. And may I request him to kindly take the session forward. Dr. Sinha. Thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be moderating this session. And you know, the, one of the advantages of moderation, uh, moderating a session is that you don't have to say anything. You just have to listen. And I, we have a great panel here, uh, Dr. Subir Gokran, who is with Brookings Institute and was Deputy Governor uh, in RBI before that. Mr. Nimish Kampani requires little introduction. Uh, and uh, then there is uh, Dr. Surjit Bhalla, as you know, he's a prolific writer and you, we all read what he says. So while it is my pleasure to, uh, to uh, put this context in place, I wanted to just highlight a few things uh, as to what it is that I would like the, the panelists to talk on. But before that, just a quick word on the format. Uh, you know, I'm going to ask uh, all of them after uh, I, I set it up to talk for about eight to ten minutes. And then at the end of that, I'll open it up for questions. And when you ask your questions, Make it a question rather than a comment. If it would be, it would be great if you could be brief. So, do we see green shoots? And what I would like the panelists to talk a little bit about is, no doubt, the macro environment in India in terms of the fiscal deficit and the current account deficit has has looked better. But what is driving the current rally in the sensex and uh, the strengthening of the rupee? Is it that the Fragile Five, which is the new acronym that's been invented with Turkey, South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia, and India, that India looks uh, a better bet than Turkey and South Africa, and so some of the external funds are coming in? At, at last count, about $2.6 billion came in this month. At the time when the external FIIs were bringing money in, the domestic uh, institutions were actually selling. So while the domestic institutions sold $2 billion, the FIIs brought in about 2.6. The other issue was that even last year, it was the FIIs who brought in about 20 billion, but the domestic institutions sold about 12 billion. So if you look at the issue from a macro perspective, the external elements do seem to be looking somewhat positive. Is that just comparative or are they doing or do they know something that we don't? The other, because if you look at the IIP and other uh, indicators of manufacturing, they continue to be fairly dismal. And the one area where you see actually a lot more hype than any real action is with capital projects. I had done a calculation that over the period from 2007 to 2013, there were about 5,400, 150 crore projects and above that came in, of which 2,540 are stuck for various reasons. And of that, about 1,934 are stuck for over two years. So when a capital project is stuck for more than two years, Nimish Bhai will explain better than I that basically the capital is all wiped out. So how do you imagine that these projects will get started? And can you actually have any growth momentum in India without infrastructure and capital projects coming online? So clearly what the FIIs are seeing is somewhat different from uh, what the domestic institutions are seeing. Because on the macro level, if you are just doing a comparison between five countries or six countries, and with Crimea, Russia is also not looking very hot. So it is a safer place to invest than others. And I have come to find that whenever you go, these acronyms, Fragile 5, Mint, Brick, etc., seem to affect them more than the underlying. Because the domestic side, there is a pretty, still a pretty negative sentiment. So, 
How do we get this started? Do we see green shoots? Well, the only green shoot that I see till now is the fact that the macro level is a bit more stable. But other than that, it is uh, uh, much of the start, the clearances that have been given have not really talked about the financial uh, closure that is required for these infrastructure projects. So one of the things I am going to ask the panelists to address is, where do they see the green shoots if they see them? And the other thing that, as a moderator, you have the benefit of doing is to ask a few awkward questions. And the awkward question that I'm going to ask each of the panelists is that at the end, when they finish their, uh, their uh, opening comments, I do want them to make a prediction on next year's GDP growth rate, on next year's IIP, and the next year's CPI. So um, uh, Dr. Subir Gokran should have no problems doing that, considering he was trying to monitor that when he was in RBI. So with that, could I ask you to uh, give some opening comments, uh, Dr. Gokran? Uh, thank you, Jan uh, And also let me begin by thanking the organizers, CII, for inviting me to participate uh, on this panel. Uh, I... Uh, I think the framing of the issues that you made is, is, is uh, appropriate and it's uh, something that I would have done myself. Start with the macro and then talk about a few structural issues uh, that I think are of critical importance uh, in terms of determining whether a recovery is going to materialize or not. Uh, you're absolutely right in saying that uh, the recent uh, stabilization in the macro situation that we've seen uh, is uh, the major green shoot uh, in terms of at least creating some sort of a platform for uh, the drivers of growth to start uh, uh, kicking in. But it's in a sense a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. Uh, and we also have to uh, put a little bit of uh, emphasis on the sustainability of the stability itself. Uh, the two or three things that I think are, are quite uh, significant, one, uh, that uh, the rupee uh, dynamic has clearly responded to the uh, narrowing of the current account deficit. Uh, the correction was, I think, a lot sharper than most people expected, uh, but there are both positive and uncertain dimensions to it. Uh, the positive dimension is the recovery of exports. We've seen some negativity in the last month, but by and large, I think there is uh, some momentum, some buoyancy there, particularly as the U.S. Uh, consolidates its recovery, uh, that the rupee competitiveness, the, the fact that we benefit as exporters from a, six, a 60 rupee is to the dollar rate, uh, is going to provide some, some momentum to exports and is obviously also making imports a lot less competitive, thereby helping domestic producers. Uh, so that's the positive response to the, uh, to the uh, currency depreciation. Uh, on the uncertain side, uh, a lot of the benefit, a lot of the narrowing has come from compression in gold imports, which uh, is really the result of, uh, of uh, import duties and other restrictions on imports, which uh, obviously not sustainable. Uh, the investment that people need to make or will make in informal channels uh, will, will only increase yeah, as the, uh, the duration of, of these restrictions uh, uh, lengthens. And so it's, it's not a permanent solution. It worked, I think, very well to address the immediate pressure, but you have to start looking beyond the immediate for this. Uh, so uh, broadly speaking, I think the two big shocks to the current account, which came in the last two or three years. Uh, one, we stopped, import, uh, stopped exporting iron ore. That was about a four and a half, five billion dollar shock, uh, loss of revenue, loss of earnings. And two, we started importing large quantities of coal, uh, about eight billion plus in the last one, full year. And uh, that looks like it's going to continue. We do not yet have a solution to uh, either of these problems. So those are the the, I think the big stress points on the current account and we have to deal with those if we're talking about uh, a more uh, enduring stability on the balance of payments and consequence, consequently on the rupee. 
So short-term rupee stability, I think, is a huge factor in uh, the kind of capital inflows that you referred to. Uh, but I don't think we can take it for granted. Uh, it's not something that is going to remain in place unless we start to address the more structural issues. Uh, on the fiscal side, uh, while we've seen a, a compression of the deficit uh, and uh, we're now seeing some action on, uh, on disinvestment, at least the, uh, it's not genuine in a sense because it's really a transfer from one public sector uh, cash uh, hold to, to the government. So that's, but, you know, it's a start. Uh, but I think what we've really suffered from over the last uh, five or six years is uh, the rebalancing of government spending away from capital and towards consumption. And obviously the, the dominant factor there is the expansion of subsidies. But at its peak in 2008, uh, government spending on capital, on, on asset formation, was, or as a percentage of total spending was about 23%. Uh, it's down to about 11 or 12 now. And you know, in a situation of, of extreme pressure on infrastructure, uh, I think this is, this is a very, very negative trend and something we have to reverse. Uh, let me come to the, uh, the three structural issues that I want to emphasize. They're related, of course. One is on food inflation. That's uh, something that has been with us uh, over 10% year on year for the last six years and more. Uh, it's not been the same set of factors. We've had a phase when uh, proteins dominated. We've had a phase when vegetables dominated. and. Uh, over the last 18 months, uh, rice has been a huge contributor to this. Uh, if, if we have food inflation at over 10% year on year, uh, monetary policy essentially uh, is constrained, is contained. Its ability to, uh, to stimulate is limited. Uh, and you know, whatever the position may be, uh, that uh, force, that, that driver is going to play either a non-existent or a limited role in uh, stimulus, in, in reviving growth. Uh, the second, I think these, both of these points were, were made by Mr. Gobalakrishnan in his speech. Uh, infrastructure is uh, broken. Our PPP framework uh, you know, worked well in some areas, but broadly as a strategy, it seems to have hit a number of brick walls. And uh, we have to start to figure out how to get, we're talking about a trillion dollar investment in infrastructure over five years, that's a theme of a session tomorrow. Uh, but we can't get a trillion dollars through companies that are financially stressed or institutions that are financially stressed. So how do we repair, how do we get a trillion dollars through broken balance sheets? And that's, that's going to be a huge challenge. Uh, those balance sheets will have to be repaired. And my uh, sort of thought on this is that the government, for at least uh, the short to medium term, is going to, have a, going to have to play a much larger role in financing infrastructure than was presumed in the development of the PPP strategy. Uh, how it's going to do this, I think, is the big challenge that uh, we need to address, uh, both in terms of raising revenues, where I think the GST offers a solution, plus some asset uh, sales and so on. Uh, and what sort of institutional and execution framework it's going to create to be able to deliver is the second challenge. So these are two big, big, you know, uh, kickstarters, if you will, for growth. And the third uh, and last uh, is employment. Uh, we heard the numbers. We heard uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan. We heard the minister talking about the demographic uh, forces. Uh, if you looked at the budget speech, the interim budget speech, there was a reference to the number of people that the National Skill Development Corporation had actually certified. It was in uh, a few lakhs. It was a drop in the ocean. This process, I think, has a lot of promise, but it needs to deliver uh, much faster. But it's not just a question of skilling people. It's also a question of who's going to create the jobs that is going to absorb these people. And that mismatch, I think, is still very acute. Uh, we, we haven't yet uh, found the solution there. It has to do with infrastructure. It has to do with uh, labor market reforms. It has to do with a number of other things. Uh, so these are, to me, the, the big structural bottlenecks that have actually taken the Indian economy from a high growth path to uh, a slower growth path. And uh, we cannot uh, you know, look at, at least I would not be able to predict any kind of a recovery uh, in, of, of substance, of significance, without actually addressing these. So here I want to you know, make uh, or draw a historical parallel, because although we uh, 
uh, look at 2014 and 1991 uh, and highlight the differences. We were not in that kind of uh, we're not in that kind of uh, of dire straits on the external front. For example, we had two weeks worth of impo of uh, reserves. Now we have seven or eight months or whatever it is. But I think the key similarity between the two has to be recognized also, and that is that that was a point at which, without some very significant reforms, uh, structural reforms, very dramatic kind of breakthrough reforms, uh, the prospects for the economy were very, very bleak at that point. And I think the same can be said now, that every time we reform, we get four or five or six good years, and then we hit the next set of bottlenecks. That's how e economic growth happens. It's never a smooth process. It's not that you solve your problems once and for all, and then you have an infinite horizon for uh, growth. Every few years, you're going to hit a new set of bottlenecks. This is true of economies. It's true of companies. It's true of individuals. You have to keep dealing with these bottlenecks. And we have, we have hit these bottlenecks. We have uh, hit these brick walls. And it requires fundamental reforms to address them. So 2014, to me, in that sense, is very similar in its compulsions uh, to 1991, that we had to break through then, and we have to break through now. Without that, I think we will just be muddling along at the bottom of the range. But you have it, Tom. But you can't get away without answering with your predictions for next year. Well, I got, out of, I got out of the forecasting game a few months ago, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. But I think my, my qualitative predictions are, uh, Im do emerge from my assessment. That is, you know, we've got to start to see some significant uh, attempt to address these structural reforms, they will, uh, structural bottlenecks. They will not pay, bear fruit immediately, but I think uh, they will create a momentum which uh, will lay the foundations for more rapid growth. So the next year I don't see as being very significantly different from the current situation in, on any of the fronts that you mentioned, except perhaps the balance of payments may be a little more comfortable than it was last year. Thank you. Uh, Nimish Bhai, could I uh, ask you to give us your perspective on... Chalmeja, you asked me a question that why market is going up. A lot of people are asking this question. Let me a little bit look back. If you really look at the Sensex today, it's around 22,000. Exactly in 2008, January, we were around 22,000, 20,000, 21,800 to 22,000. What has happened in the last six years? I think in the last six years, we have just seen problems. Scams, problem, satyam, telecom, and then coal blocks, and now we saw NSEL. So all these problems only have come. Industry made a lot of mistakes. They went and bid in infrastructure pro project on a very competitive bidding, including in power project, road project, where the margins of profits were not there. And it cannot sustain on a long run at one point, you know, <clears throat> one rupee and 20 paisa, you know, power supply for next 20, 30 years. So I think uh, industry also has to be blamed because they took wrong decisions you know, on those matters. Most of the corporates, the top corporates, who had bid for this kind of infrastructure projects have suffered. They were huge debt created themselves. The debt equity ratios are in a mess. Their projects have done overruns. And they have gone through, in the last five to six years, a lot of problems. What is the choice before those corporates? They've started now selling their assets because that's the only thing they can do and get the cash flow. So in spite of all those things, what is market thinking? Because fundamentals are not that great. Current account deficit, fiscal deficit, Mr. Gokan has just now told us, I'm not going to repeat that. 
So what is what is market is looking? I think uh, market is always right. I can't ignore the market because market is a collective wisdom of a lot of people, and that collective wisdom have a lot of information to them or analysis to them. So market is expecting today that in the coming election there will be at least a stable government. And if the stable government takes place, market will be right. But if the stable government does not come in, and a khichdi government comes in, market will take about turn. So it's an expectation theory of the market, which is taking market to a different ball game. What has happened in last six years? In the last six years, the earnings of the good corporate have gone up, but their price earning multiple. Some of them, you know, has not substantially gone up. Some of them have gone up. Some of them have not substantially gone up. Therefore, these six years indirectly, the industry has seen a consolidation. And this consolidation, which industry has seen, industry now believes that if they get a right government, right type of policy, you know, certain changes which we need, like GST policy issues, etc. I think. The new phase of the growth is going to now come in. What is coming in our way is again, you know, the inflation, the monetary policy, and there also there is a silver lining because inflation has started coming under control. RBI is very clear that they don't want savers to suffer because you can't go on reducing interest rate with inflation. And savers don't get return, and we had 36 percent of our GDP as savings. Now we are below 30 percent, and therefore there is a need to bring back those savers also back, you know, into investment mode. Therefore, it's a very tough task for the Reserve Bank, you know, to take a decision whether to reduce interest rate or not. I think next week we'll get some inkling where the governor will make some statement because there's a policy meeting. Next week, what I personally believe is this: that slowly the worst is getting over. And if we get a stable government, I think the economy will start moving forward. The most important suggestion which I would like to make is this: that if if interest rates are dropped to industry, housing, and automobile. These two industry, if they turn the corner, I think the growth momentum will start taking place. In my experience of last 40 years, I always seen when the automobile start changing and the demand for you know you know automobile starts coming in, I think the economy starts on a recovery. But last two years, the commercial vehicle sales are on decline. So I'm only hoping against hope that yes, you know there is a chance. If interest rates are drop, demand for this vehicle comes in, and the industry starts moving upward on that basis, there will be multiplier effect, you know, because of the automobile industry revival. Same applies to housing because today the real estate is in a dump, the demand is not there because the uh, <clears throat> whole of the North Belt, even now West, is started filling a little bit because uh, uh, all the new construction which has taken place. You know they need you know uh, people to come and buy the homes, and that is where you know the financing. If the interest rates are drop, then all the multiplier effect of buying of the home etc. will come up. Now these are all short term you know phenomena. In the longer term, I think uh, we need to strategically think about you know uh, make sure that we reduce our import into import substitution. Like you know, we have to input iron ore and coal. How do we? We are 200 years of coal supply available to us, and we are still importing coal. So I think there is something wrong in the economy where the right kind of decisions are not taking place. We need to also think about export strategy very clearly. That how do we you know work on our exports? One more thing which I feel we should think about is infrastructure. Where the government will have to play a greater role, and there, for example, to give you an example of a tourism industry, you know, we don't have even uh, 
3 million to 4 million tourists in our country. Only tourists which comes are our non-resident Indians and other people, you know, come or a low-grade tourists are coming. Why? What we don't have in our country, we have complete sea coast. Beaches are there, mountains are there, jungles are there, you know, history is there. What we don't have is infrastructure. You look at a country like uh, Spain, 50 million tourists. France, 65 to 70 million tourists. I think, and our country has everything. And still, we don't have a tourism in our country. If you just take a strategic view of the government that yes, in the next five years or ten years, we want to go at a particular place. I think it's possible to get 50, 60 million tourists. You'll get foreign exchange. You will, uh, you know, create employment. You know, all the industry, you know, ancillary industry towards, you know, servicing them, hotels, transport, you know, you know, uh, air, aircraft, all, all those industry, you know, will start working on that basis. What we need is a very clear strategic thinking and allowing those things to develop. So I think uh, the, the view is this that I am cautiously optimistic if the government, stable government, whichever government comes in, a stable government, right kind of government comes in, I think, uh, you know, we are moving towards a new era of growth. What is our problem in our, our capital markets is the capital. Industry, new entrepreneurs, they all need capital. We are a capital short economy. Unless we raise capital through market, and that savings of the people are channelized towards the capital market, I don't think, you know, that we can move forward and supply capital to our, our corporate sector. Thank you. Nimishwa, you haven't told us your prediction for GDP and IIP and inflation. No, I think uh, <clears throat> as far as GDP is concerned, again, you know, it's a, it's a question of uh, changing a psychological factor. If the, if the right kind of government comes in, I see the growth momentum starting. Maybe can't predict for 14, 15, but 15 and six, 15, 16, if that happens, we should be back at six and a half, seven percent growth rate. You know, subject to, you know, I'm caveating it that uh, there should be a right kind of a government. Decision making should become faster. Central and state relationship should improve. So there are a lot of caveat on that basis. And along with that, the industrial production... Uh, Nimishma, I never knew work. you were an economist. Now you are starting to give so many caveats. What to do? <laughs> what to do? <laughs> yeah? Can't help it. We have got to move. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Thank, Thank you. Dr. Bhalli. <laughs> Yeah, in answer to the question is a recovery in sight, plus the associated uh, forecasts, if you will. Um, you know, my, somebody just before the session started as to what sector uh, are the green shoots being seen in, and my honest answer is that, look, I'm a macroeconomist, so I'll give you my views on the top down and what happens at the top, and there are various elements that go ahead uh, and make that. Now, as a top-down, if you will, observer, um, essentially in my study of, of growth in, in countries, um, you want to have very few variables uh, that you look at. And if you will, and some of you have heard me say this before, uh, the primary variable for growth um, is basically inflation which is associated, therefore, with interest rates. So if you get inflation and interest rates in order, you will get growth automatically. Um, and what level it is, I'll go into a little bit of detail. Now, I will present, if you will, my assessment of the economy in, in two phases. The phase one, assume for a moment that there were no elections around the corner. So therefore, uh, that is what would happen in a, in a broad sense 
uh, which is inevitable given the business cycle uh, that is, uh, if you will, uh, has been operating. And the second part is obviously uh, what happens in elections, uh, and I will give my assessment as to what the impact on the economy will be if uh, the elections, as uh, both the observers before said, if you have a, a stable government. Now, in order to understand, so the first set of forecasts or first set of assessments is independent of elections. Now, in order to understand where the economy is at um, and therefore where it's likely to go, let's look at the last six years, which by any definition have been the worst six years in Indian economic history. Actually, I lie a little bit. Uh, because the, it's actually three years as far as growth rate is concerned, and it's six years as far as inflation is concerned. And then 2008 and 2009 were the global crisis years, etc. So basically, let's think about it, the last three years as far as growth is concerned, last six years as far as inflation is concerned. Why is it that you know, we had reasonable growth rate over the last three years, something averaging 5% per annum. And, you know, if you take any historical average, uh, that is clearly not the worst by a long shot. The only difference is, and this is a very important difference if you're looking at growth rates, is that this 5% growth for three consecutive years has been, if you will, achieved with an investment rate, investment to GDP ratio of somewhere around 33 to 35 percent. Take 1980 to 2002, and we grew at an average rate of 5.6 percent with, if you will, an average investment rate of something like 22 percent. So what you have, you have 50 percent more investment, and you're actually growing at a lower pace. So therefore, the growth scenario, what we've seen in the last three years, by any reasonable definition, is absolutely, absolutely the worst we have ever encountered. Now let's look at inflation. Inflation for the last six years, 2008 onwards, in India, and we, it's given that the RBI now uses the CPI, I'll use the CPI, but actually the same story emerges, uh, if you will, with the GDP deflator and to a certain extent with the WPI. But let's take the CPI. The average inflation rate over the last six years, without much variation, has been, and the only variation is above the median, not really below the median, um, has been 10%. Take the data from 1950 to now, all the available data that we have on Indian inflation, including those years when we had droughts and therefore very high uh, inflation, CPI inflation for the last 60 years, the highest 65 years, the highest it's been is 10.5% in 1975, which was, if you will, three of those years or two and a half of those years was on the basis of the OPEC price increase for oil of 400%. So therefore, really, that was a real outlier. The second real outlier is right now. So therefore, you know, if you are going to make a forecast of what is going to happen as far as GDP growth is concerned, you have to make a forecast as to what's happening to inflation. And therefore, then I think the RBI and all the actors come into play uh, as to what they'll do. And therefore, we assume that they will do the sensible thing. Now. The good news, that's the bad news. The bad news is we have gone through hell. Okay? The good news is that in a cyclical sense, there is a recovery. It's almost inevitable that you will get a recovery. But that recovery cannot come about unless you get a decline in inflation. And here's a really, really good news. The decline in inflation is upon us, okay? And how do I say that, and what's the model that I have? We still have the CPI, YOY, et cetera, at 8.1%, which is still amongst the highest on record prior to the last six years, if you will. 
So where do I say that, listen, inflation is under control? Well, inflation is under control because of what I look at, the determinants of inflation in India, of CPI, is primarily, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily through what happens to food prices. Food prices, food, the, the food basket is about 48% of the CPI. And if you will, in India, the food prices are determined by the government, especially now, through the procurement pricing system. In 2012-13, the average procurement price of all the goods, or all the crops that the government, uh, that sets the minimum support price for, was 16%. The uh, average, sorry, it was 12.7 12, 12 or somewhere around 13% was the procurement price increase two years ago. Last year, the procurement price increase for the first time in the last seven, eight years came down to 6%. So therefore, you have got, a, if you will, baked in into the system a, at least a three percentage point decline in inflation. Uh, whether the RBI acts tomorrow, or, or next week rather, or a month later, or whatever, the essential point that I want to make is that inflation, because of what happened to procurement, not money supply, not interest rates, not anything. Interest rates have had zero effect on inflation. Um, and so therefore, none of these, or the fiscal deficit, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a believer in the fiscal deficit at all of causing anything. Uh, it really is an effect, and we look for it, but I challenge anybody, including my esteemed colleagues, anybody, uh, to find me any relationship of fiscal deficit with either the growth rate in India or with the inflation rate. So therefore, let's forget about the fiscal deficit. It's an effect. It's a consequence of what happens to growth, uh, and broadly speaking, though we do have the episodes of the last five years where the government goes on a spending rampage. But controlling for that, and really, that's not that excessive. They really went on a rampage in terms of setting up uh, minimum support prices to the degree they had. And we can, perhaps in another session, think about why is it, after six years of consecutive, eight years of consecutive increases of double-digit uh, increases in the price of uh, uh, food, uh, that the government decided uh, to really raise the, import, uh, the procurement price by only 5%. Okay. So, one, inflation rate is declining. Second, interest rates will follow. Third, we will have a bounce back in terms of a catch-up with, um, with the uh, decline in the interest rates and everything else associated with it. So, GDP growth is bottomed out, uh, no question. Inflation has stopped out. Interest rates have peaked. Now, we bring in what happens with inflation, uh, with the, the elections. And, you know, I, I'm not so sure the stable government, you know, which is used, I think, by my colleagues as a euphemism. Uh, I, you know, we've had many episodes. We've had a stable government the last six years, the last ten years. We've had a stable government, right? It was never in doubt uh, that they were lost. But maybe, uh, um, so it's, it's, not, it's not exactly what you want is a stable government. Uh, we had, if you will, unstable governments from 96 to 98, and you still had reforms. Uh, we had a 22 coalition government from 98, uh, from 99 to 2004, 22 parties coalition government. Many people at that time thought it was highly, highly unstable. Uh, turned out to be stable. Uh, so therefore, I'm not so sure a stable government that India needs, and a stable government can be quite rotten. Um, so you don't want a stable government. I don't want a stable government. Um, but you do want a government that is able to make decisions, and if you will, not just decisions, intelligent decisions. This government has been known to make lots of decisions. Uh, I'm not so sure I would describe them as intelligent. So therefore, we really have to be clear about what is needed. You need reforms. You need economic reforms. And you need, if you will, decision-making, uh, decisiveness, and if you will, um, uh, you need decisiveness in terms of where you're going 
and how do you get there, and some knowledge about that. So therefore, to conclude, I think um, you know, if we do get, if we get a Khichdi government, uh, and let's make it in simple terms, if the BJP gets uh, only 180 seats uh, or thereabouts, I think you will end up with a Khichdi government. Um, and uh, my own forecast is, independent of anything, if the BJP gets 180 seats, I don't think they'll form the government. So really, it won't be that bad because people will wait for the next time when there is, if you will, a, a stable government. Um, but if the BJP were to get 220 seats and above on its own, I think we are looking at, quote unquote, a stable government. Um, now in terms of forecasts, um, I think, you know, independent of, uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the Indian economy. Lots of low hanging fruit. You mentioned oil as a very simple one, or Subhid mentioned, uh, there, there's lots of it. Um, there is the tax reform, the GST, and the, um, and the DST, the direct taxes. Um, so I think, you know, first two years um, can be a nice bounce back uh, with a stable government, not as, not as good a bounce back without a stable government, but you will get a bounce back. But after that, I think basically we need to do reforms. By reforms, I mean the first most important reform is labor law. Let the people be. Why we have been hostage to 5% of the workforce, where the ideology comes in, etc., you guys may know better. But I think time has come for India to join the 20th century, let alone the 21st century. My hope and expectation is that is an absolutely necessary condition for India to meet its twist with destiny and various other things. So what's the number? Store. Now for the forecast. Um, <clears throat> so I am not afraid to make forecasts. I guess that's the nature of my business. Uh, while I'm making the forecast, uh, let me remind you of what a professor of mine told me who also made a lot of forecasts. He says, as a forecaster, you have to keep two rules in mind. One, forecast often. And second, always remind people when you're right. So therefore, unfortunately, uh, we will have to meet again next year in order to see whether I remind you or you remind me uh, as to uh, where I went wrong. But very simply, the CPI, and this is my major, major forecast, actually, uh, the CPI between 5 and 6% for 2014-15. Between 5 and 6, so give or take, make it 5 and a half. Um, industrial production, also between five and six, um, and the GDP, seven plus. So, Woo. thank you. <laughs> thank you. You know, as is the norm, if you have the first session after a minister, you always uh, give the minister a few minutes. So because we gave the minister 15 minutes, we have taken that away from you. And so when you go to the elections, just remember that you have lost 15 minutes to the minister. We have run out of time for question and answer. But I would just like to say that uh, if you were, uh, uh, Dr. Surjit Bhalla uh, came out with very clear predictions. Uh, uh, Subir uh, talked about the fact that it will be similar. But whichever way you look at it, between seven and five, we are looking at perhaps a bottoming out already happening. And Nimish Bhai was also saying why we are going to get some capital and why the markets are looking for stable or different or changed governments. So if you look at it, are, are we bottoming out? Well, it looks like it. But my own view is, till we can get a 50,000 crore package for infrastructure, much of this will continue to be ephemeral. So we need to actually get movement and get our i rates uh, lower, which I'm surprised to be after your article yesterday you didn't mention today, which is really important that we need to get uh, investment productivity higher, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Bhalla also mentioned. But overall, we are seeing some brown shoots starting to green a bit. Thank you.